Page one sixty. Air travel would have seemed very strange two or three thousand years ago to men keeping their sheep on the mountain sides. All these changes are the outcome of the great step taken in the invention of numbers. Before men could count, how did anyone know which were his sheep and which were another man's? He put his mark on the sheep. He was their owner. They were his own sheep. He owned them. Sometimes he gave his sheep names, and then he would go through all the names with his sheep to see if they were all there. Page one sixty one. Before the invention of writing, how did people keep records? They made pictures on soft earth or sand, but rain and wind and waves quickly washed away such records. Smooth stone or wood was better. And best of all, the smooth stone walls of caves, whose roofs kept the rain and wind away. It may be that the drawings copied on page one forty-two, or others like them, were records made by early humans. Someone recording animals on a cave wall may have taken pleasure in the drawing for itself and become the first artist. Page one sixty-two. How did a man know how many sheep he owned? Sometimes he used small stones or sticks, putting one of them into a bag or pocket for each sheep he had. When he came to the end of his sheep, the number of stones in the bag was the same as the number of his sheep. The stones in the sheep were equal in number. The stones gave him a record of how many sheep he owned. When a sheep died, he could take a stone out of the bag, and when the lambs were born, he could put in another stone for each lamb. Page one sixty three. Sometimes a record was made by taking a sharp, hard stone and making cuts on a stick. The number of cuts in the stick equaled the number of things to be recorded. Then the stick was cut in half down the middle, so that each half had half of every cut on it. The two half sticks were tallies. If they were put side by side, the halves of the cuts came together. They tallied. One man took one tally, and another the other, and both then had the record. Page one sixty four. Tallies are some of the earliest and simplest records of the numbers of things. They tell how many things have been counted. Even today, in a bank, a person who takes money in and gives it out is sometimes named a teller. The shelf or table where the teller works is a counter. On it, the teller does the counting of the money coming in and going out, and keeps a record of all this in an account book. A person who makes a statement tells something. Most banks make a statement every month to each person banking with them to tell them what their account is. The statements tell them how much money they have in the bank at that date. Then both they and the bank have the record straight. To get these statements ready, the banker has to take the amount of money given out from the amount of money put in. Page one sixty five. Bank tellers must keep a complete record of the money they take in and give out. This is their way of making certain that their accounts are in order. Banking is a very important sort of business. A bank must keep all its accounts in good order, and the statements which the bank makes must be true statements. Page one sixty six. How do we know whether someone is telling the truth? If a man tells another that he will give him three bags of grain for one sheep, the other will know whether he told the truth when he gets the grain or doesn't. The man may or may not have meant to give the grain when he said he would. He may not have meant to say anything but the truth, but if he did not give the grain later, he was not true to his word. We sometimes know whether a man is telling the truth by the look in his eye, or the sound of his voice. Page one sixty seven. 
In early times, before people invented money, they did all their business by exchange of goods. People traded with others by exchanging goods they were willing to give up for goods they wanted more. Exchange of things still goes on in some parts of the world today. After the invention of money, trade increased. It is our experience that money can be a great help in making trade easier and in keeping business in better order. If you want something and have the money for it, you can buy it. You do not have to keep asking yourself whether you have something which the other person will be willing to take in exchange for what you want. Page 168. Early people did things with their hands, which we do with instruments or by machine. Fingers were made before forks. Among their early uses, fingers made good counters. We still use the number 10 as the key to our number system because we have 10 fingers. Many people today still count on their fingers, and others use an abacus. An abacus is a frame with little balls threaded on wires. The balls are pushed from side to side on the wires. The invention of the abacus made it possible for the balls on one wire to represent the numbers up to 10. On the next wire, tens up to a hundred, the next, hundreds, and so on. Page 169. The most important number in the number system used commonly today is zero. Zero is so easy to use that it is hard to understand why it was not invented long ago. It is thought to be not much more than a thousand years old, and no one knows who invented it. We use zeros to change numbers to others. Zero to the right of a number makes it ten times its size. Two zeros make it a hundred times its size. Six zeros after one make it mean one million. Schools today teach a child to add, subtract, multiply, and divide numbers. Here are examples. Page 170. People made their way about on the earth, over mountains, down rivers, and across seas long before they had a number system or could make or use a compass. Nobody knows who invented the compass. The Chinese, Arabs, Greeks, and Italians, among others, say they did. When people became able to work out the relations of lines and spaces to one another and could measure distances and angles, the science of geometry, earth measuring, began. People went on then from measuring fields and bits of land to measure the size of the earth itself. Page 171. The Greek scientist, Erothocenes, was the first man to work out the size of the earth. He heard that there was a deep well into which, on one day of the year, the sun's light went all the way down to the bottom. He took the angle of the sun at the same hour from another place, 500 miles from the well, and worked out by geometry that the earth was about 29,000 miles round. The size of the earth, scientists now tell us, is about 25,000 miles round. Page 172. Geometry starts with ideas about lines and spaces. Here are two circles. In two squares. The circle on the left is inside a square. That is the relation of that circle to that square. The square on the right is inside a circle. That is its relation to the circle. These are facts about the circles and squares on this page. Statements which tally with facts are true. Statements which don't tally with facts are not true. It is untrue that the square on the right is outside the circle. To say it is would be to make a false statement. Page 173. What is a circle? It is easy to see what it is, but not equally easy to say what it is. Here is a straight line half an inch long. If you could turn the line right round like the hand of a watch, it would have covered a circle. 
One end of the line would have to keep in the same place, while the rest of the line was turning. Here is another line the same length. It is half an inch long. If you could pull it down like a map on a roller, a distance equal to its own length, then it would make a square with sides half an inch long. This is not a square, though its sides are equal. Why not? Because its angles are not right angles. This is not a square, though its angles are right angles. Why not? Because its sides are not all equal. Page one seventy four. Six thousand years ago in Egypt, there were people who saw how to measure their land through their knowledge about squares and triangles. How large is this square? What is its size? Because the square is on squared paper, it is easy to see what its size is. We count the number of small squares in the large square. This number is the area of the square. If the small squares were an inch square, the area of the large square would be sixteen square inches. If they were one foot square, the area of the large square would be sixteen square feet. If they were one yard square, the area of the large square would be sixteen square yards. Whatever the unit of measure used, the relation of side to area is the same. Page one seventy five. People took the first units of long measure from their bodies. The end of a man's thumb is about one inch long. A tall man's foot is about twelve inches or one foot long. A long step is about three feet or one yard long. The simplest way of measuring a short distance is to step it. These units of long measure have been a great help to us. They have made it possible for us to measure and compare lengths and areas and volumes. Measuring lets us build a room the size and shape we want it. For example. Twenty feet long, sixteen feet wide, and twelve feet high. Page one seventy six. Sometimes a family's fields were not square. Some of them were like this, or like this. People walked across their fields. They planted them and took in the grain. They knew how much land they had from working them before they could measure them. They saw that a field like this. Was the same size, though not the same shape, as a field like this. Before they knew that they could measure how long and wide a field was, and then get the area by taking one measure times the other. Page one seventy seven. They saw that they could get half a field in this way, or in this way. Before they knew how to measure rectangles or triangles. Can you see whether these two fields have the same area? Put in lines to prove that they are or are not equal in area. The answer is at the bottom of page one seventy eight. Page one seventy eight. Here is a right angled triangle. The two shorter sides are three and four units long. How many units long is the longest side? Can you tell without measuring? How? About twenty-five hundred years ago, a great Greek, Pythagoras, proved that the square on the longest side of any right-angled triangle is equal to the squares on the other two sides added together. We can use his discovery to get our answer. We multiply the length of each of the two shorter sides by itself. We add the answers together. Then we find a number which, multiplied by itself, gives us this number. Page one seventy nine. Here is the answer. When we multiply a number by itself, we square it. Any number is the square root of its square. Five is the square root of twenty five. Page one eighty. It was not until many centuries later that people put this knowledge of geometry to wide use. The development of science had to wait until the days of Galileo and Newton. In the last three centuries, 
Our ways of living have been and are being deeply changed by science. These changes can be compared only with three or four great earlier steps in the history of human development. These are the birth of language, the use of fire and farming, and the invention of writing. Here is a horse walking round and round the mouth of a well. He is pulling on a strong stick of wood, which is kept turning by his motion. This moves a chain with buckets on it. The motion of the chain carries buckets full of water up and takes empty buckets down. The horse has a cloth over his eyes to keep him from seeing that he is walking all the time in a circle. Would he stop if he knew he was going round in circles? Page 181. Today, machines are the workhorses. They are doing what people gave all their days to doing in the past. Muscles get less tired in the machine age, but they often get more tired in other ways. We are finding that we need more and more time to work out the direction that our lives may best take. We need a new design for living. People carried water from springs and rivers and pulled it up by hand from wells long before they learned even how to turn a chain round a wheel. They put a cord round a wheel and turned the wheel round because that was less hard work than pulling full buckets up the well by hand. The steps have come slowly because each has to be taken before the next. A next step was to put another bucket on the other end of the cord so that an empty bucket went down as the full one came up. Page 182 In one of the well-known Uncle Remus stories, Br'er Rabbit, a little animal who always gets the better of the other animals living near him, gets into a well bucket, and down he goes to the bottom of the well. As his bucket goes down, the other bucket comes up empty. How am I ever going to get back up? He says to himself. After a while, Br'er Fox comes along, looking for Br'er Rabbit. What are you doing down there, Br'er Rabbit? He says, looking down into the well hole. Page 183 I'm doing a little fishing. There are hundreds of fish down here. How can I get down there, says Br'er Fox. Just get in the bucket, Br'er Fox. It'll bring you down in no time, says Br'er Rabbit. And as the fox goes down, up comes Br'er Rabbit to the top in his bucket, as he wanted to do. The two buckets go by one another on the way. Good day, Br'er Fox. Some go up and some go down. A happy landing to you, says Br'er Rabbit, with a smile and a wave of the hand. Such stories about animals are as old as any inventions. Page 184 Here is a water wheel being turned by water power. The weight of the water falling into the buckets turns the wheel, and the wheel in turn turns great round stones for crushing grain and making it into flour. Men took their grain to the miller to be made into flour. Then they took the flour away and their wives made it into bread. People did all this everywhere in the old days, before the invention of steam engines and electric power. Page 185 Here is a windmill which does the same sort of work. The wind pushes the sails of the windmill round. The work of the windmill is dependent upon wind. When there is no wind, the miller cannot make flour, because there is no power to turn the millstones around. There is an old song about a miller who lived by himself and could be heard singing a song all day long. I care for nobody, no, not I, and nobody cares for me, sang the miller. What he meant was that he did not love anyone and that nobody loved him. He had no hopes or fears. He did not hope for anything or fear anyone. Page 186 In many parts of the earth, the climate is either too hot or too cold for humans most of the year. 
but it is now possible to put automatic controls over temperature into houses, offices, and work plants. Here is a thermostat, which keeps the temperature of the air as high or low as we want. We put the pointer at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the thermostat will keep the temperature of the room near 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the point on the scale to which the pointer points. Page 187. A thermostat is designed for this purpose. Its design makes use of our knowledge of what metals do when heated. This is the way it works. Different metals get larger by different amounts as they are heated. Two long, thin pieces of such different metals are bent together like this inside the thermostat. When the temperature in a room goes above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the metal on the outside gets longer than the metal on the inside. This moves the arm to the right and shuts off the fuel in the heating system of the house. Page 188. When the room gets too cold, the piece of metal on the outside gets shorter and moves the arm to the left. This turns on the heating system and more fuel is burned to warm the house. The purpose of putting a thermostat into a heating system is to control temperature. In hot climates, what is important is to cool houses by sending fresh cold air through them. We can control the temperature of the rooms and, in addition, dry the air and have a climate of our own making indoors. Every ice chest has a climate of its own inside it. It is strange and surprising, but true, that ice chests are kept cold by using heat. The heat is supplied by electric power or by burning gas. Scientists tell us that before long, we will be using the sun's heat to cool buildings. This will make life in hot climates much easier. Page 189. There are many other sorts of automatic controls. In this hotel, a door is automatically opening to let a man go through. His body is shut off the light from an electric eye as he walked past it. In this bank, a bell is ringing loudly because someone has touched a window. The man was hoping to break into the safe. Many offices, banks, stores, and work plants are kept safe at all times by such automatic watchers. Page 190. Here is a night watchman in a motion picture studio keeping it safe from danger of fire at night. He has his time clock with him. He walks all night long through the plant from one station to another. At each station, he pushes his time clock against a key, which is fixed in the wall. This key prints a number on a long, narrow roll of paper, which is moving all the time through the lock of the time clock. In this way, the time clock makes a full record of whether and when the watchman went to each station in the studio in turn. The time at which he was at each one of them is recorded. If a number is not recorded, that is proof that the watchman did not go to that station. Page 191. This record is necessary before the insurance company will pay for damage done to the plant by fire. The insurance company needs to know where the watchman was all through the night. The motion picture company pays insurance money every year to the insurance company. In exchange, the insurance company will pay for any damage to the building done by fire. But the motion picture company is responsible for keeping the studio as safe as possible from fire. The night watchman with his time clock is part of the system of keeping the studio safe from fire. Page 192. Here is a more fully automatic part of a system of controls against fire. Some metals meld at low temperatures for metals. Thin lengths of such metal are placed at many points in the plant. A fire starting near one of these points will quickly melt the metal. This starts an electric system working. It opens outlets through which water comes down from the ceiling to put out the fire. The price of such a system may be high. 
but it is much lower than the price of a new building. Such insurance is cheap at the price. Page 193. Much of the work in present day factories has to be automatically controlled. The much talked of assembly line was a first step in this direction. It lets us make automobiles and many other things much more cheaply than they could be made before. An assembly line is a moving line of parts of whatever is being made. Each worker does one thing to each automobile. As it goes by, the work of each is dependent on what has been done before. They are parts in an overall design with an overall purpose. If you make workers into machines for short working hours, you can free the rest of their time. What for? To what purpose? What are we designed to do? This new free time has been given us by the workers and thinkers of the past. We have to think about what we will do with it and about the best possible use of it. Page 194. It seems sometimes as if we want very much to put an end to waiting on one another. There are many ways, for example, of making the serving of food in restaurants more or less automatic. One of the causes of the high price of food in restaurants is the use of waiters and waitresses. One waitress can serve only a small number of people if she has to go to and from the tables with trays. And fewer people than before are interested in doing this sort of work, even when the hours are short, the pay is good. And the work is not too hard. In present day living, more people than ever before eat at restaurants. Many families who used to have servants now do all their own housework. Page 195. There are ways of making restaurants self serving, that is, of getting the public to do more of the work so that fewer waitresses are needed and less time is wasted in waiting to be served. The nearest thing to complete self serving is the automat. Food and drink are put into boxes with glass doors in front. You look at the food. If you want what you see, you put in the right amount of money and the door is unlocked so that you can open it. You take the food out and shut the door again. Fresh supplies of food are put in the boxes as they are emptied. Page 196. More and more use is being made in public places of automatic machines, which sell food, cigarettes, drinks, stamps, or even books. To make buying and selling simpler and more automatic is important. Too many people have to give up too much of their time to shopping for their families. Some of them use up a large part of their lives going from shop to shop to get what they want. And waiting in line for people to serve them. Serving themselves frees them from this. Page 197. There are great food stores today where every sort of food, meat, bread, butter, milk, vegetables, flour, sugar, salt, fruit, whatever it may be, is put out, each in its place, on shelves for everyone to help themselves. You take what you want. Put it in a little cart if there is much of it, and take it to a control counter where you pay for it. An automatic adding machine is used to give the amount you will have to pay and to make a record of the things you have bought. The adding machine prints the price of each thing on a roll of paper. You see how much you are paying for each thing you are buying, and how much what you have bought adds up to. Then you get a list of the amounts recorded. And the store keeps a copy. These records of everything sold help to keep the business of the store in order.